Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, so the topic that we are going to discuss today is the agile shift left now. Uh, my part is basically to do with the agile shift security. How do we shift left the security part of the software development uh, process? So uh, let's start by talking about two most common uh, development methodologies that we have. Uh, one being the waterfall. Uh, so the waterfall was first used around in 1956 and got more popular in the 1970s. So it's a basic simple end-to-end -end, uh, software development process. So if at all any new chain needs to be introduced, it would take months uh, to get that implemented. Then came along Agile. So Agile, the term was first coined in 2001 and it gained popularity uh, with the rise of consumer internet uh, industries and the cloud computing. So while the subfaces are generally the same, like the plan, design, deploy, subfaces are the same, the difference comes when, where uh, in the waterfall, it's just one-sided end-to-end uh, phase for uh, waterfall. And uh, as compared to the smaller phases called sprints in Agile. So the sprint approach comes with from the understanding that all the requirements are not known upfront. And even if we are uh, we know the uh, requirements, they are bound to change once we start interacting with the users. Uh, and, and the customers, when you start building the product, their mind can change or even the need for the product can change. And the final uh, understanding is the techno technology uh, innovation. So technology comes out at such a new pace that it is beneficial if we use the latest technologies sooner rather than later. So then comes the Agile DevOps. Agile can only succeed and be efficient if automation is used between all the steps in each sprint. Uh, performing all the processes manually within each sprint actually slows down the whole start to finish process. The Agile DevOps basically have two different, uh, two most important parts is that is the continuous integration and the continuous deployment. The continuous integration are the tools and processes that automate the development process of the build and test. So uh, we can add new functionalities and you can say smaller improvements. While uh, the continuous deployments are the tools and process that basically enables the operators to uh, quickly and easily push the new functionalities, or often maybe just one module at a time. Uh, Agile DevOps basically is an extended Agile methodology for product development. Unlike how the conventional uh, waterfall project management was replaced by Agile, a DevOps is just a succession to the Agile and not a replacement. Agile can be defined as a continual iterative progressive uh, method of software development, whereas when it comes to DevOps, it is a synthesis of software development and uh, and the, you can see the operations. Now let's see uh, what are the common points between DevOps and Agile. So both the methodologies, be it Agile or DevOps, work towards a shared goal, that is enhancing the business productivity. They both have lean approach on a huge scale. They, uh, both the uh, uh, methodologies have a collaborative working style irrespective of the method implemented. They both rely on continual feedback and routine updates about the work in progress, maybe uh, from the internal or even the external stakeholders. Both, uh, both Agile and DevOps, they focus on developing the product at a fast pace by usually keeping smaller teams and using a risk-free approach. And both uh, methods, they adapt to the the final point is they both uh, adapt to the business uh, requirements and they continually improve the products to fulfill the customer expectations. In order to maximize the benefits of DevOps, or you can say agile DevOps, organizations must uh, execute the principles at the very start of the product development process. Because shifting it to the end, it won't be help. Uh, it won't be helping to you know bring in the scalability and uh, the feasibility. But while talking about all these, where is the security in the whole process? So somehow in the race to embrace the benefits of DevOps, organizations didn't include their own security teams. 
And while we think that DevOps is, in, uh, is encouraging security, the result has been wild waste. We have insecurely deployed uh, servers, database, and applications, and uh, without maybe uh, considering the disaster recovery and the backups. The every see every day we come across the new uh, news of data breaching and hacking. So, is is there any loophole in the application development we may think of? A security breach can result in loss of billions of personal records, uh, even the confidential information, and overall would affect the business a lot. So the traditional methods that we have for uh, development currently are outdated in the tech savvy world. Where today, where countless uh, applications are created and uploaded on the web store, a security breach is a prime concern for businesses and application developers. So to cope up with the secure, uh, critical uh, security crisis, DevSecOps has come out as a savior. So uh, Donovan Brown has, says that DevOps is a union of uh, people, process, and products to enable the continuous delivery of value to end users. If we, if we just take this definition one step forward, the union of existing rapid software development and the infrastructure along with the security functions uh, which results in reduction of risks for the organization while continuous delivery is is the uh, is the process, uh, is the definition of secops so just to get uh, some more brief on this so the devops is about flexibility in the development process whereas devsecops it's about using security as a fundamental part of the tra transformations. Essentially, uh, Agile uh, sets the framework for the entire development cycle and DevSecOps layers in the security needs. Now, uh, let's uh, see one of the examples that we have. So anyone can uh, just uh, tell me what, what this is about or <laughs> Any any uh, any idea that comes into your mind as soon as you see this picture related to uh, security, maybe for process checking, right? Yes, yes, you're right. So this is basically an uh, X-ray scanner to make sure the process food does not contain any metals. So an important note to take from here is that the defect checking is a part of the process. It just sits uh, on the top of the conveyor belt. Like unlike, I mean, if would any factory accept a process that all the products need to be removed from the conveyor belt, move to a table, scan one at a time, and then put back on the belt? No, they wouldn't, right? This this kind of approach is not appreciated. So same same principle applies into introducing the security into the DevOps. So let's uh, look into the scenarios here that we have got. So the first scenario is uh, the development starts without security. So the software quality is only checked during the runtime. So uh, this often, you know, results in conflicts or uneasy conversations between the security and the development team when the vulnerabilities are found. Moving on to the second scenario that we have, the security teams have invested the time from the start to understand the development process in their organization. In return, the development team has identified the vulnerable codes and, and, and they have fixed it prior to the deployment. The security team has also taken time to embed the security process and tools in the CICD pipelines. Thus, that has resulted in an automatically checking of security defects. The result of this is much better when, uh, as compared to the first scenario where the vulnerability scans show good results and automatically uh, it has you know, added a security quality to the whole process. So uh, this is a traditional view of the security that, look, that is currently in most of the organizations. You, you need agility to meet the requirements of the digital business, but, but it is at the same time, it is also critical to ensure that security and compliance are built into your app from the start. So that involves thinking about security and compliance as code and not as an afterthought or add-on. 
when security is not initially built into the code the compliance can be even more difficult to achieve so as a as a result when we are nearing the deployment uh, for a release and uh, uh, if the uh, during the readiness check we are doing all sorts of security testing and the assessments during that time if the critical or high vulnerability uh, uh, security issues are found the release has to be stopped or until and unless the issues are fixed so this can cause a delay of weeks or even months uh, for some cases here the traditionally what we have is when when we do the dev test and uh, we are ready to uh, do the deployment just before that the security box is added so that just before that the security tests and assessments are done moving on to the shift left tech terminology that we are talking about here since the start <clears throat> shift left is being used by software development to improve the quality in the development projects and also to re reduce the downstream disruptions agile uh, as such a uh, shift left when it aligns with the agile development the output is that you are doing more earlier when it's when it's cheaper and more effective also it's a continuous development and testing the benefits of the shift left can be uh, seen like they are very cost effective we get good test coverage uh, bugs are found very early and fixed uh, early and uh, there is a better uh, collaboration between the developers and the testers so one would now wonder if it's if if the shift left is so good for development and for testing why can i not apply it for security the shift left security basically is nothing but you know it's, it's i'm sorry it's not about doing the same things earlier rather an opportunity to do a different and better things earlier so <clears throat> the this is the new shift left view of the security that we are thinking of the, as you can see the security box has moved and moved to the start of the process so moving these pro process earlier in the devs uh, pipeline is known as a shift left approach so in 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 the most in the most simple terms that we can define uh, the shift left security is moving the security to the earliest possible point in the development process we also uh, we can we should consider that shift left security is not just good for uh, reducing the cyber risks but also the cost because the uh, during the uh, system science in, uh, the system science institute at ibm they have uh, during a survey found that addressing security issues in design was six times cheaper than doing that uh, was in the implementation phase so it's it's much more cost effective in that sense we need to make sure that we embed uh, security throughout the software life cycle to identify the vulnerabilities earlier and to perform faster fixes uh, thus reducing the cost as well so every organization that has devops should shift its gear towards devsecops you know to get a higher level of proficiency and data compliance and also more secure application development experience so instead of rushing at the last moment of uh, of any situation just uh, devsecops ensure that security at each level is present each level of the development process uh, moving on to the steps that can be used you know for implementing the shift left security in any organization so the first is define your strategy so the first step of any journey is to define where you intend to go so <clears throat> we can have a written strategy document so we, we do not underestimate the power of a concisely written strategic document it is very critical you know to define what shift left means in your own organization so this this is more about painting a vivid picture uh, possibly for your own team so that they know what the final uh, final uh, product or the success final success looks like so the the key items to include are the vision uh, ownership and the responsibilities milestones and the metrics 
now uh, we, we i mean while making this document uh, there's no need of putting so much time to perfect it uh, the strategy document matures over time and iteration over time is obviously essential in this case how can we communicate to facilitate better teams and improve productivity? It's a major point in defining your strategy and to implementing the shift left security, but that we need to communicate to facilitate better teams. But how do we do that? How do we achieve the communication? The answer is backlogs. So the work backlogs and the boards have done wonders for Agile and DevOps. And we extend upon, we, we need to extend this upon the DevSecOps. They basically encourage collaboration and ownerships. So teams work together to determine the priorities and there's a clear progression of activities happening. So the security team don't need to create uh, reports in words or PDF. They just need to create tasks in the backlog and uh, this will allow for clear prioritization. The next step in implementing is, the code, is to codify your security. So define and define and codify security since inception. So security uh, policies, uh, they are defined and they are codified for any application at the beginning of a project. And it is kept in the source code repositories. Uh, the security policies, they also have to be automated. So by pressing a button, you should be able to evaluate whether your security policies for any application, be it any stage or environment, are uh, good or not. So this is a major uh, benefit when uh, that happens when you follow the principle of security as a code. Everything about the security is codified, versioned, and automated. The security artifacts are checked in as code into the repository and version. Uh, next is the define uh, security user stories. So we, we need to define uh, the security uh, user stories and do a security assessment of the application and the infrastructure. Architecture-based security uh, user stories must also be defined just like how we define the normal feature stories. So this process will ensure that security is not ignored. The final point here is to identify and implement security uh, quality quadrants. So every step, like we saw in the scenario uh, two, every step of the software development process, we, we can have the opportunity to give feedback and look for security issues or enhance the security as uh, security uh, quality as and when we go. The next point here that we have is the training. So it's, it's a fact of life, or you can say fact of this industry that um, we cannot be expert in everything. We, we cannot be expert in development uh, and security and operations, right? To, so to succeed in DevSecOps, we need teams that have cross-pollination of skills. So the developer who understands the application uh, vulnerability testing, uh, the security engineer that understands the web server configurations. With, with, with the new skills that come into, uh, when, when we have new skills coming into our uh, thinking, we get new patterns and we come up with new ways to solve the problems that are presented with us. Security awareness. This, be this begins on the first day when new hire starts, right? When we give them the trainings on passwords and shoulder surfing. Apart from that, we need to add the specialist trainings as well. So, so like the developers, they should get trainings on uh, writing how to write good quality codes with secure coding and also the most common exploitation methods. So this can give them a ownership of the security, uh, but also give uh, not, you know, also, also force them to think through these issues, which is very critical. Finally, the training uh, that needs to be reviewed. So training isn't a one-off thing. It is a multiple times per year thing. So training is not just a PowerPoint slide uh, or the same video every year. So training needs to be reviewed regularly to ensure that it covers the uh, latest technology and the changes in the security landscapes. Final step is how do we integrate security? So, we come back to our original infinity, infinite loop uh, that is the DevOps. Uh, question for everyone, uh, where do you think uh, we should integrate security? 
in this infinite loop? Any idea which phase or which uh, area do, do you think we should be integrating security? Between code and build, right? Right. Uh, any other, any other uh, answers? I would want to implement it from planning on forward. Yes, so that is that is the right answer, Sheila. the The answer is basically every step along the way. We need to we need to have security built in. So it's the security is basically uh, as you're you're as strong as the weakest link in the chain. And in this case, the chain is your loop. Also, uh, uh, an important point here is the automation. It is very crucial here. So we need to be able to integrate our security tools with the rest of the continuous build and release pipelines. So if your tool needs to be manually triggered or cannot feed in the results back to the backlog, it, it might not give the expected results. Uh, let's let's uh, uh, see how at each and every phase of this uh, DevOps loop, can we integrate uh, security? So first comes the planning. To integrate uh, uh, security into the planning phase, we need to integrate security into the sprint plannings and the review meetings, all the scrum meetings. We need to consider the security user stories earlier in the sprints. Next is the coding phase. So training, training reappears. So how, how do we write a good code? We need to ensure that developers know or get proper training to write secure codes. Another important topic and very, uh, I think everyone will be aware of this is the test driven development. So at, at this point, uh, if, we, if, if we are writing unit tests for specific modules of code, then why not include security tests as well? So this way, as the, as the model is then written, we are already working to ensure that it is following security practices. And the last is use of correct tools. So tooling is very important here. There are a, a bunch of uh, plugins and tools that are available for the users to, to alert them for any kind of bad practices. So we need to invest in these kind of tools to help uh, developers to spot the problems earlier. Next is the build phase. So uh, during the static and the dynamic code analysis, we can view uh, how, the, how the things are going. We can use these tools because during the build phase, if the security check fails, then, then, the, the, then it's not of high enough quality you know, to proceed down the pipeline. So we need to ensure that everyone is aware that expectation is for the expectation is for the high quality code to proceed for the testing and onwards. Uh, next, coming on to the test phase. So, automated testing, like I said, is very crucial for DevOps, but also for DevSecOps project. Testing is how we ensure that our code is up to the mark and its quality is as as what we would have want to deploy. So be it any kind of testing, unit testing or the form manual testing or a UAT testing, we need to include security test cases with along with those so that we know that the system is performing securely. Next is uh, fuzzing. Uh, fuzzing is a term basically, uh, it's becoming very popular right now. It's, it's a process of sending random inputs to, uh, to the software to spot security holes. Um, a large number of vendors are producing great fuzzing tools. Some are even able to you know, uh, automate tests with integration of our pipelines. Uh, finally, uh, in the test phase, we have the load testing. So it not only proves that the application infrastructure can handle the load, but it can also help uh, you know, to determine if it can handle more than what is, is, what is expected, say in the event of an attack. Uh, coming on to the release and deploy phase. So when an application gets to the release and deployment stage, we, we might think that there's nothing much for us to do, but that isn't the case. At this point, uh, our code would be, or our changes would be uh, in the dev, dev region, or you can say the pre-prod environment, right, prior to the dev, uh, production. So why, why not we perform an end-to-end -end vulnerability assessment and scan not just the application, but the entire site? So that would include a servers, database, and maybe load balancers. So th this is basically, uh, 
your first time uh, seeing the applications and, and it's uh, supporting elements in the whole entity. So let's make use of that opportunity. Finally, in these last two phases, the operate and uh, monitor, we need to monitor the logs. We need to rescan for vulnerabilities. Uh, we need to have a structured patch process and we need to track dependencies. So if, if you can just uh, see what uh, along all the phases, if we are uh, starting from the start and applying security to uh, from the from the planning phase, there's the pressure of uh, having security checks and if vulnerability scans are giving a positive result is very less towards the end of the operate and monitor phase. So that's a good benefit from having it from the start. Now, uh, for implementing these steps, uh, and just to give a rough uh, timeline to this, for maybe all the agile facilitators here in the call with us, uh, for the first week, uh, we can aim, you know, to take a, a counting of all the current security tools that you have in your own uh, in your own team, or are, are, are those tools DevOps friendly, and uh, you can engage and discuss with different teams uh, about DevSecOps maybe uh, give them some information about what DevSecOps is and can we go ahead taking in, uh, into these uh, areas. For the first quarter, if we are aiming to achieve this, we need to integrate security into any one of the development cycle, at I mean, at least in one of the development cycles. So, and also measure the outcomes. So um, if whether the vulnerabilities that were identified versus the, the um, number that was fixed before release. So all kinds of metrics, uh, simple metrics that you, you can confirm whether the DevSecOps is actually working for you or not. Finally, for the first six months, uh, you can implement self-service and uh, continuous security, uh, consolidate the security tools set. So it's not, it's not necessary to have new tools. You know, you can have your existing tools used in a new manner. So that can also uh, have a lot of dollar savings. And finally, you try to expand to more projects. So as, as, the, uh, as we have the conclusion here and to conclude the whole uh, talk that I did just now, the purpose of DevSecOps is to ensure that every security breach is addressed and the vulnerabilities are reduced to the minimum. So during the process, everybody is accountable for the security and the actions from the, uh, and the I mean, be it from the developers to the uh, op operation department, everyone is responsible and accountable for the security act. And instead of instead of approaching uh, security as an add on process at the very end of the release, or or even as a periodic security scanning of broad environments, why don't we start with security at the beginning of the application release? So we can represent it as a code and we just bake it in. By by following those uh, these best practices, I think successful uh, product uh, or even the product teams can ensure security while maintaining the agility and the speed of innovation. So these steps, when put together, can help any organization to come up on a solid path. You know, not just uh, only by shifting the security left, but actually making security uh, synonymous with the development. So this is what I had uh, for you guys for shift left testing. Uh, any questions that uh, that I can take off? The floor is open for you guys. That was a great presentation, Akanshka. Yeah, uh, well done. Um, Nikki, uh, how's your line doing at the moment? Uh, am I audible? You are now. Great. Um, is it good that I start sharing the rest of it? Like Akanta have covered brilliantly the security aspect of shifting left. And there are a few aspects related to shifting left testing I would like to present. Excellent. And, uh, and then we could do some qu joint questions. While we have, yeah, right. We have got some questions on the chat. Akanta, if you would like to look meanwhile, and I will just go through, sorry. If, yeah, apologies, we have run through the inverted cycle of our presentation, but still I would like to give a brief background of what is shifting left. So the principle behind the shifting left is that any process 
or any step in a process which we are doing later in a cycle we bring that particular step earlier into the process and the 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 purpose of doing this is to address unknown issues later in the cycle and build up better products or better applications and it also leads us sorry to interrupt nikki but are you sharing uh, we can't see us yes i pause i will share again is it now visible kancha not yet maybe if you drop your camera maybe it's um that might help stop it you're right yeah maybe bandwidth um not helping much akansha as a backup would you like to present uh, my slides on your system okay sure just give me a second sure okay and uh, since we are talking about the background i was just talking what is shift left and how it addresses a problem prevention so basically rather than problem detection in a process at a later point of time we are bringing a step closer in the initial step so that we prevent the problem at the very first step for example if i talk about testing then in traditional waterfall model testing was done just before releasing the product in production this meant that a serious problems uncovered so late that it can cause major um disruption and redesigning and causing lost lo long delays by shifting left we are going to prevent this problem rather than just um rather than just uh, doing a problem detection at the later uh, state and fixing um i can't show the first slide the background one yeah sorry so this was the page i was talking about and as of now in software industry there are few disciplines which have adopted shifting left and this involves testing security deployment and design i'm briefly talking about testing security akansha just covered for the benefit and we still have two other areas in the, the software development which we are not covering in current scope of presentation that is deployment and design but those are also very apt into the current cloud uh, cloud deployment environment where we are continuously deploying and there are latest fixes and features uh, which are going on so we are using patterns of automation and streamlining them also briefly talking about the design shifting lens so going beyond the requirement the entire team can adopt a design thinking mindset and this way everyone would have a shared vision of the product so this was about deployment and design just one brief statement and let's talk about our next topic which is relative cost of defect um yeah so this says that the later the discovery of the defect we do in our software development cycle the higher its cost will be and it nearly doubles in the industry so the industry standard says that it doubles with every phases uh, the cost of fixing of the bug and also there is and on this slide you can see that how much percentage of bugs are coming out in from our different steps of software development life cycle so most of the bugs 56% more than half of our bugs come from the requirement phase that means most of the time the requirements are understood wrong design 27% this also tells that there are a lot of bugs which are coming out of the designing going wrong somewhere or understood wrong somewhere and coding only adopts um, attributes to only 7% of the bugs wherein our most focus normally lies and there are some other relevant uh, specific to domain and performance issues etc which for 10% of the bugs so definitely it makes sense that we start fixing the bugs earlier in the development stage going to the next is how the hidden cost of finding and fixing the bug impacts us so from this diagram we can see that the normal flow is that we take the requirement we code them then there is an integration testing involved and finally is the uh, normal testing what is carried out by the uh, testers in the team so 
if the code uh, is wrong and it is identified at the integration step, then definitely there is a loop back to the code. And if it is coming by uh, the time we are already done with integration and we, we are doing some testing at the very later step, that is uh, system later than the system integration testing, then if a bug is recovered at this point of time, the loop is bigger. We are going to fix them and now there will be a redeployment required. So this is multiple switching backs. What is going to cause us um, a lot of delay in our uh, planned release cycle if we are not doing testing earlier in our life cycle. And some of the other figures which we can see in the next slide is some of the reasons why organizations are avoiding changing this approach. Normally what is happening, uh, then the projects usually see, okay, there is not enough time that engineers now start testing. We are having so many features to develop. Uh, why do we put time to now do the um, testing right now? And normally we don't have many resources to do the testing. Also, we can't afford scheduled delays if we are bringing more testing earlier. That's a mindset. That is not an actual uh, reality on the ground. So this particular uh, graph, what we can see, it shows that the first one is the planning phase, wherein we are talking about, we, we did the requirement and design. This is the blue one, and then we code, and then that, that is the testing side, which is ending at the 30th. So this is the plan. But if we go by the normal approach, the traditional approach, then if we see after doing the coding, the apart from the testing phase, there is a bug fixing round, which consumes more than the planned effort normally, and which causes our uh, release delays. So the approach which we should plan and adopt is bug prevention by adopting more testing during the coding time, and it will land us back to the original plan goal. Um, Next one is a, some, some samples what have come uh, around from the world of software development. So this is observed basically from um, Google and there has been some findings coming out from um, Google's study in a book published and uh, that says that roughly the amount of uh, cost to fix a bug increases in this hierarchy. So unit testing is five pound, uh, $5, full build 50, and that's this getting 10 times with each cycle we are going down the cycle. So Google estimated in 2012 in the book that it's roughly $1,500 worth of a bug fixing uh, cost it had cost. Now quick check on to the V model that has gone um, for our longest period of time in our waterfall model, which say that once we write a feature, then we write the stories, we write the code, and then we do the testing of the code, we test the story, we test the feature. So the actual approach of shifting left will bring us closer, uh, the testing closer to every cycle. So we write the course, code and we also write the testing for that code. And, um, I will go first with the features, sorry. Writing the feature involves testing the, uh, writing the features of this, writing the testing of these features first. So this builds up a mindset of always thinking about testing while we are doing a requirement analysis. Writing a story, it should involve writing of the testing of this story at this particular point of time. And writing code, this also involves that while a, coder is or a developer is writing the code, he have to think about te the test cases, what should address this code. Let's see uh, how uh, the think test first approach requires us to build these tests. So once we are writing uh, the feature, the, the feature test can be written using the behavior driven development, which we call BDD. While we are writing the stories, we also write the BDD, uh, we write the test using the BDD again. And once we are writing the code, we can write the test using test-driven development. And what should be the ideal flow is that uh, once we decide that uh, what has to be built, we have to analyze and create some Yeah. 
So we analyze and create some tests at the point of time once we are analyzing. And then during design, we are again uh, going to use the test which we have done during the analysis phase and make sure that our design is testable. During implementation, using the previous test to make sure that the code is without defects. Testing and then deploying. So it also involves right, while we are doing uh, the behavior devel development, we write the scenarios which are not existing in the system. So that becomes our requirement. We try to build a feature at this point of time, wherein we try to write minimum amount of a feature or a code to make it possible and make it pass. And we refactor it in every iteration until that feature is implemented. And same happens with the TDD. We write a test which should ideally face, fail at the first point of time because that functionality would not exist. We have to make it pass and we have to go through multiple iterations of refactoring, of updating the code, of re removing all the redundancy in the code until we reach to a point of time that our code is developed. Talking uh, some uh, more detail on a BDD, I'll give an example on the next slide. So, here is an example. So basically, uh, BDD is written in given win and then format, which is a Gherkin format, and also it imbibes all the understanding from the business and the agile teams. So let's take an example. We have been given a task to add include including of VAT and delivery cost to the total price of a customer basket. So let's say business gives us a business rule that VAT should be 20% uh, 20 delivery cost of small basket. Uh, which is less than 20 pounds should be three pound delivery cost of medium basket which should which, which is more than 20 pounds should be two pound this amount of um, requirement is sufficient for us to start coding and going further in our software development life cycle but there are multiple ambiguities which are there which will be unaddressed if we are not looking from the perspective of all of the users involved in this story and how can we capture that by bringing in some examples so we can get some examples from the business while we are gathering the business rules so let's say in the above uh, business rule we cannot tell whether what will be the um, cost if the uh, basket is having just exactly 20 pound of uh, um, uh, of the uh, of the um, items in the basket so that is not addressed in this but in the example we Nikki, we lost you. Nikki, are you there? Um, oh, I'm, am I audible? You are now. Yes. Yeah, you were cut off in midstream. I was just, I was just getting into that. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. What I have, what done, I have done, I have taken a backup in a backup in a mobile. mobile. Okay, I'm back in the laptop as well. Sorry. That was my plan B, but I think I am now audible. Yes, yes, Nikki, you are audible. Okay, Continue. yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah. So here we can see that the, the format of the story is given when and then, and that explains who are the users involved and what point of time exactly a developer have to code so that the amount is added. So it says that when I add it to the basket, it is more of a user perspective and that is going to help all uncover our requirement related bugs later enough um, in our uh, testing cycles. Quickly talking about the test driven development. So this is the practice of building and executing the tests before implementing the code or the component. This is totally a developer led testing and it requires a mindset from the developer before he is writing the code. So it starts from the mindset. So while uh, even before writing the code, the developer have to write the test and run the test and it should ideally be a failing test the first time he runs it because that functionality would not be existing at that time so he now should write the code that this case this test case what he have written is passing and in in iteration he goes uh, again and again he refactors his code until this particular code um, the test case basically
some issue in laptop. Sorry, I have again unmuted myself. Yeah, audible now. Okay. It's a gotcha. So another approach I was talking was testing with testables. So unit testing is quite an early phase for a developer to write the testing at this point of time. And some of the integration pieces or some of the other steps might not be some some of the other functions will not be available. So there can be uses of steps or a testable which can um, which can help a developer write the test cases at this point of time. Coming down to the next slide. Um, Okay, so in the test driven development, Asha, I think we can go to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. So this diagram basically shows that uh, unit test cases can be automated at the very first time and uh, the, there should be enforcement by the developer for some methods of implementing the unit testing at the early cycle and he, he can uh, keep on refactoring his code. This again, um, same theory what we just talked in the previous slide. So we can move ahead. Okay, this is the exact step what a developer takes and which we briefly talked. So he, um, he have to add a test, he have to run all the tests, see if it is failing, write some code more, and then refactor and run the tests, refactor the code again and repeat. This is a flow. Going next. Okay, this is a test pyramid, which basically shows a, a way of working from Google and which is recommended by SAFE also. So this is a test first approach which should ideally create this pyramid. If we see there are some large and slow test cases at the very top, which is which are the typical large end to end UI test cases. And it suggests that doing that is going to take uh, the maximum amount of time. And for the same reason, they should be minimal. And there should be there would be some medium um, medium uh, test cases, medium sized test cases, which would be talking about external services or UI related uh, testing. So they can be medium sized, and they could they should be also less in number. And most of the testing, which can be um, minimized to a level that there are many test cases which are at the lowest end and be executed very quick, quickly is going to benefit in, us in a long run. So that's what is suggested to be followed for industry-wide software practices. If we do not follow, this will become an inverted test pyramid and cause a lot of delays in our release cycles and a lot of money and time. Okay, yeah, Kansha, do the next slide. Okay, the next thing is how can I get started with ShipLab? So as an agile facilitator, I have also started thinking about this and I have communicated in, uh, to my developers and we are taking in uh, our planning and innovation in Sprint this time. And this is how we are also working. And this is a suggestive approach that developers can take some testing tasks. So basically uh, they learned uh, about the test case writing and collaborate more. Testers also start writing the code and they focus on to the automation testing. This way, testers will focus on some of the part or the area where developer are not focusing and developer will have most of the things addressed at the very start, bringing less and less bugs at the later point of time. So adopting TDD and BDD and a testable mind, and a mindset wherein we are talking about testing at the early stage is recommended. And then we have to have static testing plan, automation scripts, and API testing, which can be written before the development starts. This is an approach we can start. And deployment procedure should be standardized. This talks about that we should be having a deployment environment, which also enables us doing a lot of implementation early in the cycle so that we can test everything earlier. So then that sums up overall the shifting left of uh, testing and few of the references which I have used are, is, are on the last slide. And that sums up everything what I had and Akansha had and we are open for some questions.
Let me stop sharing. So maybe there's one question for uh, you, Nikki, from Nag Shekhar, that if we are using security phase from the planning phase, is that not cost effective? Maybe. It's... So Nag Shekhar, are you there? Would you like to explain the questions, question once again? Yeah. So Nikki, everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So just wanted to understand how can we test the security at the development level because security comes in the production level, right? Uh, like DDoS effect or those comes in during the production level, right? How can we do this uh, security testing in the development phase basically I wanted to understand. I'm really new to this agile way of working, but wanted to understand how can we do this testing at the development phase, the security test? Yeah, thanks for your question, Aksegar. Just to say that we are also very new to this, but what I have understood till now from all the analysis is that we build up the mindset at the very start. So while we are go doing a requirement analysis, for a software product, we start thinking about what can be the security implications of it while we will implement it. We can take such, such insights from the very start and we would at least write those testing cases at the very start that let, let's use BDD and TDD to write those test cases at the earliest. So this will address at least having them very, I mean, they will not be popping up later in the point of time because we would have a knowledge of them the understanding with be, will be with the developers at the point of time while he is going to write the code and the and at, to a certain extent it will be addressed and while he will be doing the unit testing he can have some um, some kind of a framework there are multiple frameworks available in the market so once he lands up it to exact coding phase so he will have those uh, unit testing automated in a way that once he is landing into the develop deployment phase, he have most of the test cases run. And there will be definitely few testing cases which will be end-to-end -end nature. So those will still be carried out at the later point of time, which might uh, be like performance and other stuff. Yeah, Akansha, in case you want to elaborate from security perspective. Yeah, actually, I was just replying to the question of security as code in the chat window. So I'm. can you just repeat what we're talking about here? Yeah. So Naga's question was basically that how we can address security at the very first step. Okay, so uh, as you, as you uh, saw in the previous slides where we are showing how do we implement security in the previous steps, so starting from the planning phase. So when you are actually planning for the project or working on the user stories or when your sprint starts, during that time, when you take on a security user stories, if they are defined in the backlog, it would be good. So when you're taking those security user stories, you are at the same time, making a model where you are ensuring that your, your feature stories is also worked upon, as well as the security user stories are not ignored and they are embedded at the same time while you are starting from the planning phase. So this is how from the start at each and every step, you can try to incorporate or integrate the security with your ongoing uh, DevOps process or maybe the agile process. The, the, the whole concept of Agile is getting into the maturity phase where uh, maturity and the collaboration phase where you are you don't need to uh, follow the previous waterfall methods that, that are already there. Or, or the, the new taking on smaller requirements and uh, finishing, off, finishing it off faster rather than taking on big requirements and having difficulty adding to the securities and uh, you know, then then instead of that, just start with the security from the start. Also, uh, there was one question about 
uh, being cost effective. So obviously, right? There is payment to find such locations at the start, maybe at the design phase or in the planning phase. It is much cheaper to solve those issues as compared to when your changes are already deployed into the production or you have implemented those changes. So during that time, if you want to do any kind of uh, security and hand uh, correction, that would again involve all the changes and the whole life cycle, the development, the deployment, testing, and everything. That would obviously increase your cost rather than uh, comparing to the comparing to working on those issues in the design phase you know it, it it's around the security issues finding that they are found later in the stage as, as Nikki also mentioned in her slides it can be around 10 to 15 times costlier so that i hope that answers your question sheila has a hand up uh, hand raised sheila yeah um i think what i was hearing is that you're assuming that there won't be security in the development and test environments. Now, if you're developing something brand new where there is no customer data, it's not replacing something that's in production. Um, maybe that's okay. I don't know. But most of the things I've been involved with, you're even if you're developing a brand new system, you're going to port over customer data from something that exists and you're going to use real customer data to test. So if you're not having security as a part of your development and test environments, you're putting your customer data at risk. Agreed, I mean, agreed. Yes. I'm not sure if the, I think that was what was being and I just wanted to make sure I understood if that was what someone was saying is that they don't have any security in those environments. Because that would be an audit point in most companies I've worked at. Yeah, so uh, I agree with your point, Sheila, but the uh, security factor is uh, not about securing the user data. I mean, obviously, it is about that. But the point we are mentioning here is do it, do, doing the security assessments or the compliance related security that we have that is generally done at a later stage of the life cycle, maybe towards, maybe just before the prod deployment or even after the deployment is done. So doing that kind of checks beforehand in the dev and test region, we are, we are talking about that security. Obviously, if we are using user data, uh, even be it dev or be it stage, we need to have a uh, uh, sufficient security to handle that data. It should not be a loose case, right? Well, if you're Thank talking I about one second, yes. but will the stakeholder allow the production data to be deployed, uh, to be taken in the dev environment? Because in the dev environment, we will not be having the third parties to do the testing, right? We will have only the dummy data, which will be doing the testing. Correct. So yes. how come a tester do the testing in the development environment with the production data? So generally, uh, whenever, I mean, most of the organizations, uh, we don't directly put a production data in the dev or the state environment, right? Uh, either we have separate data for those environments or we do a redaction uh, before we move the production data into the lower environments. So that kind of uh, risks are always handled before uh, doing any kind of shifts uh, of the production data from the production environment. Also, just to add on, uh, probably the continuous deployment is one area which is always enabling continuous testing. So if we deploy quickly into the production, we are doing the testing earlier. It's not we are waiting up till a very last leg of time, like in a traditional waterfall model to do the deployments. There is another aspect which enables continuous testing is continuous deployment. So once we have continuous deployment, we will know about the security and we will be able to test them earlier. So the, the, the both go hand in hand. Thank you very much. Um, we're coming to the end of time. Um, I know this because I'm going to be talking in about a quarter of an hour and we'll be using the same Zoom call. So, <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. Th thanks for overcoming the communication 
uh, difficulties. I think you did really well there. I don't think that matter uh, that we did the security before the testing mattered. It's all it's all a continuous loop anyway. Um, yeah, and uh, I love the way you collaborated and worked together. Um, yeah, if if, it, if people like to come off their microphones and if we give uh, if we give Nikki and Akanchka a really good round of applause for their first talk. So yeah, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, everybody, for attending, and thanks a lot for entering. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye bye. Thank you.